Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this morning of Monday the 9th of May. This Monday in Eastertide and it's a lovely spring morning here in the Northern Hemisphere in England this morning. I'm surrounded by blossom and sitting in a, a place that you will remember. But let's first uh, join our prayers for Ukraine as we always do at the beginning of our prayers thinking of all its people at home and in danger of war, away and separated from their families, receiving hospitality in other nations in the world. And we pray always for world leaders in whatever pressure they can bring to bear and whatever decisions they can make to restore peace to that shattered land. So this morning we are sitting in a place which you'll recognize. The last time I sat here, I think, was on Easter Day and we had two special visitors on that day, you'll remember. But here today is just a lovely spring morning surrounded by blossom. I've got a sea of blue alkanet by me and also some lovely green arum lilies, not the white arum lilies, but green ones called green goddess. There's white lilac behind me and also uh, around me all kinds of wild flowers which you've seen before, the butter buttercups and the dead nettles with their white flowers and a sea of Queen Anne's lace, cow parsley. And Tiger's here with me as well. He's come up to join us this morning and had his breakfast up here. So uh, we are going to say our prayers here, sitting by the stream, which becomes very important to us together with the two ponds which are beside me here. Let's begin our prayers. Bring your own intentions and prayers across the world. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. In your resurrection, O Christ, let heaven and earth rejoice. Alleluia. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As once you ransomed your people from Egypt and led them to freedom in the promised land, so now you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your risen Son. May we, the first fruits of your new creation, rejoice in this new day you have made and praise you for your mighty acts. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning, on this ninth morning of the month, is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear Though the earth be moved, and though the mountains tremble in the heart of the sea, though the waters rage and swell, and though the mountains quake at the towering seas, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the dwelling of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, therefore shall she not be removed. God shall help her at the break of day. The nations are in uproar, and the kingdoms are shaken. But God utters his voice, and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come and behold the works of the Lord, what destruction he has wrought upon the earth. He makes wars to cease in all the world. He shatters the bow and snaps the spear, and burns the chariots in the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The loveliest verse in this psalm uh, is there is a river 
whose streams make glad the city of God. It's the psalm for this morning. It's caused us to sit by the stream, but also, as we have been over the last few days and will do to next Monday, which is our last time together, uh, we are concentrating on gardens in the scriptures and helping people who love gardens and have written about them to explore the images, the, shall we say, the, the uh, figurative language, as the evangelist says in, in uh, St. John's Gospel, about the way in which Jesus uses natural pictures of creation to help us understand the fruits of the eternal kingdom of heaven. And here it's the river whose streams make glad the city of God. And our sense also in verse 10 of being still so that we may know that he is God. I've chosen this morning in our readings about uh, gardens really in the scriptures and there's chapters with a host of images and many chapters which speak of many images in all of this. But I'm going this morning to the book which is known as Ecclesiasticus, which is in the apocryphal writings of the Old Testament uh, and generally placed in some Bibles between the Old Testament and New Testament. Our Lord would have known these works. They are so um, full of little statements like Proverbs, but also of what we call wisdom writing. And I'm in the book Ecclesiasticus, or uh, sometimes it's called, as it is in this translation of the Bible, the wisdom of uh, Ben Sirach. So uh, here we're reading from chapter 24. I'm going to read the whole of chapter 24. It's a very beautiful chapter, and it's talking about the concept of wisdom, which in terms of the Old Covenant is the creative word of life, the word we believe to have become flesh in humankind in the person of the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. But here we are in writings really of the Old Covenant and wisdom being used in so many figurative ways to help us understand the purity of God's Word and the creative process, something that Jesus respected in all ways. I did not come to destroy, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, he said. And the way he does so within his own life is something that we contemplate daily. But here is chapter 24 of the book Ecclesiasticus. Wisdom praises herself and tells of her glory in the midst of her people. In the assembly of the Most High she opens her mouth and in the presence of his hosts she tells of her glory. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. I dwelt in the highest heavens and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Alone I compass the vault of heaven and traverse the depths of the abyss. Over waves of the sea, over all the earth, and over every people and nation I have held sway. Among all these I sought a resting place, in whose territory should I abide. Then the Creator of all things gave me a command, and my Creator chose the place for my tent. He said, Make your dwelling in Jacob, and in Israel receive your inheritance. Before the ages, in the beginning, he created me, and for all the ages I shall not cease to be. In the holy tent I ministered before him, and so I was established in Zion. Thus, in the beloved city, he gave me a resting place, and in Jerusalem was my domain. I took root in an honoured people, in the portion of the Lord his heritage. I grew tall like a cedar in Lebanon, and like a cypress on the heights of Hermon. I grew tall like a palm tree in Engedi, and like rose bushes in Jericho, like a fair olive tree in the field, and like a plane tree planted beside water, I grew tall. Like cassia and camel's thorn, I gave forth perfume. 
And like choice myrrh, I spread my fragrance. Like Galbanum, Onica and Stacte, and like the odour of incense in the tent, like a terebinth I spread out my branches, and my branches are glorious and graceful. Like the vine, I bud forth delights, and my blossoms become glorious and abundant fruit. Come to me, you who desire me, and eat your fill of my fruits. For the memory of me is sweeter than honey, and the possession of me sweeter than the honeycomb. Those who eat of me will hunger for more. Those who drink of me will thirst for more. Whoever obeys me will not be put to shame, and those who work with me will not sin. All this is the book of the covenant of the Most High God, the law that Moses commanded us as an inheritance for the congregations of Jacob. It overflows like the river Pishon with wisdom, and like the river Tigris at the time of the first fruits. It runs over like the river Euphrates with understanding, and like the river Jordan at harvest time. It pours forth instruction like the river Nile, like the river Gihon at the time of vintage. The first man did not know wisdom fully, nor will the last one fathom her. For her thoughts are more abundant than the sea, and her counsel deeper than the great abyss. As for me, I was like a canal from the river, like a water channel in the garden. And I said, I will water my garden and drench my flower beds. And lo, my canal became a river, and my river became a sea. And I will again make instruction shine forth like the dawn, and I will make it clear from far away. I will again pour out teaching like prophecy and leave it to all future generations. Observe that I have not laboured for myself alone, but for all who seek wisdom. I said, I will water my garden. There's an individual nature of all this in what is being said in the figurative language of the wisdom writer. But so much is resonant of the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. The old translation, because that's the one that's in my head, but so many different translations. And speaking of that eternal word which the wisdom writer is capturing in so many images, but it's a gift within us in terms of understanding which we never reach an end to, but at the same time must work out daily. I will water my garden, and in doing so, drench the flower beds with water. And we get that image so often in the scriptures. We get it in Psalm 1, uh, where, let's, let's look at the Psalms a moment or two. I'm not doing a date today, so we can spend our time a little as a garden congregation looking at these garden images. Here's Psalm 1, which always begins every month for us. And we find, Blessed are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the assembly of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night, like a tree planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, whatever they do, it shall prosper. The same image, the necessity of life-giving streams in reality, 
to cause all this freshness, all this green around us. Streams that come down from the rains of heaven and the showers of heaven, but also streams that run through to water the earth. Some of them made by the hand of the Creator, like those great rivers in that passage which flow from Eden in the story in Genesis which we read a few, a few days ago. The four rivers are noticed there, but they spread in streamlets and they water the earth around them. The great river Nile is mentioned with the fertility on either side absolutely necessary to Egypt. And one remembers in school days, in early geography lessons, uh, having to draw the picture of a shaduf, which is the way in which the ancient Egyptians, and still some today because they're very simple, would get water up from the river, swing it round and pour it into the channels which watered the gardens around. I will water my garden and drench my flower beds with water. It's a spiritual image as well as a real, real one, for without water all of this would die very quickly, both creatures and uh, also a vegetation of any kind. Or Psalm 107, which we delight to say on that morning of the month when we come to that. The Lord turns rivers into wilderness and water springs into thirsty ground. A fruitful land he makes a salty waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell there. Now those are the first two verses about that passage which means that anywhere which is full of beautiful fresh water, of lakes and streams and vegetation, by overuse and by the greed of humanity can easily be turned sour, desert land and salty wastes. Great lakes over a period turn into that and those two verses speak about that. The Lord turns rivers into wilderness, water springs into thirsty ground, fruitful land into salty waste because of the wickedness, the greed of those who dwell there, or sometimes of other nations with more power using those resources and wasting them. And then the two verses which follow, or well, the four verses which follow, are marvellous. But he makes the wilderness a pool of water and water springs out of a thirsty land and there he settles the hungry and they build a city to dwell in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and bring in a fruitful harvest. He blesses them so that they multiply greatly and he does not let their herds of cattle decrease. All because of the water and the way in which <coughs> water is harvested, treasured and also transported and allowed to flow in human-made rivers and canals, rather like the runnel beside me, which is running down here to feed the two ponds causing all this burgeoning life and allowing homes and sanctuary for so many creatures. And then one might turn to scenes like the rock in the wilderness, which the psalmist quite often uses as an image of the kingdom to come, which Moses struck in the desert and it gushed forth with streams of life-giving water. Figurative language used in the New Testament for the refreshment and fruits of the Spirit and life of the Spirit which our Lord brought himself in his own incarnate life. If we go to John chapter 7, we find Jesus himself using that kind of imagery. Let's turn it up in this version of the scriptures. I'm using this morning the New Revised Standard Version, so a slightly different version to the one we normally use. And here we are in verse 37 of John chapter 7. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. And the evangelist adds, Now he said this about the Spirit 
which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That particular gift of the Spirit was still to be given, first to the eleven and their companions, and then to the many, even to this day, throughout the world, who choose to drink, figurative language, from those living waters. But even before that, in the scriptures, think of, uh, we're reading St. Luke's Gospel at Matins in the morning in the cathedral, and we've started at the beginning, so this morning, passage from chapter 2, but yesterday we had the story of Simeon, and how Spinion, Simeon was said to be filled with the Holy Spirit as he took the child, the baby Jesus, into his arms and made that prophecy, which we call Nunc Dimittis. All of this counts as watering in parched ground. How we wait when rain doesn't come, how we pray for rain, both on gardens and in thirsty lands, and how we help people to bore into the ground to find water deep underground, for water is life-giving to all life. And the moment <coughs> water was brought into this orchard, when Fletcher built the runnel with the stones and formed the two ponds, and then began to pump water up and down, life burgeoned at once. And birds came, because birds need not only to drink, but they need food, and invertebrates like insects began to come as well because of the moisture which formed food for the birds of the air. And there are plenty of birds of the air around. There are three blackbirds sitting on a tree above me here at the moment. They've come down for the water, not only for that, but also to bathe. They must bathe to wash their feathers and keep them clean so that the air can pass through them with clean feathers. And they are very meticulous, rather like cats, very meticulous about their washing. And here's a blackbird now who's come down to the stream and is going either to drink or to wash himself in the waters. But before the waters, this was a very different place. And now, with the waters, you have a completely different life cycle. And Gerard Manny Hopkins, in one of his sonnets, which you will know, ends the sonnet because he's feeling himself not able to be creative as a poet at the time. And he cries out, send my roots rain. And that is another figurative image for the way in which the spirit of life fills us and enables our creative, our particular creative powers. So that the story of the bringing of water to this orchard, as it runs down, became a story of burgeoning new life. But, as we said yesterday, patiently we waited for that to happen. There's no way of speeding the working of the seasons, but there is a way of enjoying the development and watching and waiting and watering our garden. And everything about that is an image which the scriptures delight to use as an image for our own spirituality and creative endeavour in the two planes that the Gospel of St John gives us. So as we, as we look at those images, then that becomes really a lesson to us to water our garden, whatever that work be, if it's a real garden, which is what we're thinking of as a garden congregation, but at the same time you will know areas of your life which need refreshment, the refreshing waters of the Spirit. They don't come, well, I mean, sometimes they come absolutely out of that on their own to be received, but mostly they come when and the development grows, when we give time, be still and know that I am God, says the psalmist, and then those life-giving waters are recharged, re-channeled through our own lives. The story of the bringing of the water to the orchard. And now we have two little ponds here, uh, and there's water in other places too, but the water running all the way down to feed those ponds becomes essential to the life and beauty that you're seeing around you. And all these green leaves are covering a pond below. 
Now, <coughs> you have been used uh, during garden congregation times uh, to uh, our friend Beryl and her husband Alan coming to visit us and Beryl in a, 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 a life which is, is full of activity. She's a justice of the peace and a, a magistrate, all of those things, but at the same time she is someone who loves to take in animals and small creatures and birds that have been rescued. And when the time comes, then somewhere she wants them set free. And remember we set free four of the collared doves for her, having looked after them as they, as they began to grow. Well, Beryl and Alan came yesterday and they brought us precious gifts. Three rescue hedgehogs who have now gone in to join our other hedgehogs and they too will trundle around the garden and be quite safe. There are no badgers in this garden and there are plenty of places to let them hide and rest and also uh, they're mostly nocturnal creatures who trundle around at night to find uh, slugs and things that they can eat uh, and as they go they actually are helpful to us because of course they're controlling some of the slug life which eat our vegetables. But at the same time they love being in the greenhouse and those that are there already can come and go. There's a cat flap which one of them uses and goes in and out because they're ready to come out. These are shy at the moment and will take a while and so Fletcher feeds them quite often on cat food because they love that and there's one who is so friendly that although he can go out and does sometimes, he's always there in the evening and when Fletcher kneels down to fill the dish for the hedgehogs, if he's being a bit slow he'll find this one nibbling at his knee because he's waiting for uh, the food to be given. But at the same time all of them will find safe lodging here in the orchard when they come out. But they, she also brought six beautiful frogs, beautiful green frogs had been rescued by a lady and looked after uh, and they now are big enough to come somewhere where they too can have a life. And so we had the excitement yesterday of seeing those beautiful frogs. The colour in the afternoon sunshine was, was really lovely. Set free just here in the pond behind me where there will be plentiful food for them. We've um, Fletcher threw in a few crickets to start with just so because they've been being fed on those by the, the, the lady and by Beryl but, but now they'll receive that only for a bit because they'll begin to feed themselves and be around in the garden. They're shy creatures, we see them from time to time but water is essential for them and the beauty of these creatures finding the right place here it's this pond, this top pond, that they will find their home around and they'll go everywhere where there's moisture and find um, moist places in the shade and under stones and everything else. But they are so beautiful when they're in the sunshine and quite patient with one another as they sit and uh, look at each other together. But seeing them go free was the most lovely tribute to the way they've been looked after when they would easily have died where they were as young frogs. And then uh, the pond below uh, is of course full of the, the quite large fish and the, the turtles and all of those creatures down there in the, the, the right kind of environment from them. Everything we do here in the garden, what are we, one and a half acres or so, has to be done on small scale but we have creatures that are used to that small scale and are given life and shelter in this particular garden. Yet at the same time, all of this for us who meet in prayer day by day, all of this is really giving a figurative language to that spiritual dimension in a way that our Lord himself loved to use. There is nothing on earth which can be used to say this is what the kingdom of God is. Only it is like that. Most parables begin like that. The kingdom of heaven is like or can be likened to and then the parable starts. But in truth every season contains parables and signs are sometimes given to us which are particularly for us alone. You'll have them in your own life. You think when suddenly you're, you're caused to stop and think, ah, 
that gives what I was thinking about and puzzling over new meaning. And Ecclesiasticus says we never get to the end of that quarrying into new meaning. Some of you have shared your stories with us and we feel privileged to have been involved in that telling and receiving of stories because every day we try to share our stories with you and give things to think about. Uh, both of us wanted to say <coughs> sorry, <coughs> that as these uh, busy days towards a, a, a new way of life for us uh, are, are taking place, then we're receiving wonderful messages from you and thank you for it. There's no way at all that we can respond adequately because of the, the many calls on our life at the moment. And uh, so gratitude here is all that we can give. And uh, we can say a little bit more uh, uh, about um, the, the, the future and, and how you might still be in touch with all these things that we have done. I'll, I'll do that in detail tomorrow and the next day. Uh, but for the moment, be absolutely aware of our gratitude. And if, if there are calls for urgent prayer, then please do keep sending them for the moment and put urgent on there as you send in to the way in which prayers are communicated here. And we will either silently in the cathedral or sometimes here uh, share them on online with you. It's a wonderful thing to be talking about gardens and a wonderful thing to have uh, garden writers talking about it with us. Now one of our favourite garden writers, and we'll not only use him today, we'll use him again as we will Alfred Noyes uh, with the lovely garden that he at Orchards Bay created. One of our favourite garden writers <coughs> is Beverly Nichols and uh, I think it's because on the back of this little book, this is just a, a, a book of quotes of his, Rhapsody in Green it's called, and uh, the New York Times has said on the front, his wit and silly adventures add a bit of welcome hilarity to the all too serious literature of gardening. And on the back, Pacific Horticulture says of him, be prepared, Beverly Nichols gardening books are part P.G. Woodhouse, part James Barry, full of hilarious Jeeves-like characters and events with moments of Peter Pan magic. But one of the quotations here is of his gardener uh, and we think it was in his house uh, at Merry Hall where the gardener was called Oldfield. So when he says my garden worker that was a fairly old man called Oldfield. He was a world's champion waterer. He really loved it. It is almost as though he were an evangelist saving souls instead of flowers, as though the sweet brown pond water that poured from the can were a holy water which he had taken from some secret well of the spirit. Well, there's the natural image and also the image taking us to a different dimension as Beverly Nichols watched the watering going on. But we'll come to a quote of his when we uh, do some more this week, uh, of Nichols himself, as, as the watering goes on. But for the moment it's good to think of his gardener Oldfield watering in that way because a gardener must water and know when to water and how much water a plant needs. For water can kill a plant as easily as it can save a plant and balance is everything. There's another spiritual image. Balance is everything. Patience and balance and knowing when is the moment. Uh, Vetcher was trying to find a quote that we both remember from Beverly Nichols and we think it said, and we may find it because we've, we've the whole range of his gardening books. We think it said, a garden is not a garden unless it has water in it. The introduction of water into the garden caused life to explode. Well, we can testify to the absolute truth of all this by the introduction of water running down through the orchard into its ponds and the introduction of water everywhere, but also the necessity at all times to keep water coming. And sometimes it's, it's uh, boring work, sometimes it's lovely work, sometimes it's a, a, a job that you've hardly time to do. But the moment water is denied, 
then one is in danger of losing all the work done in a garden. And uh, so it helps us at all times to do that. The way in which insects, invertebrates and, and uh, the, the other creatures come here and the birds we've spoken about, that's become so important to us. So that the, 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 uh, the, the chain of, of, uh, of, of feeding, which I spoke about earlier in this, a, a, a few minutes ago, uh, of the birds eating the insects and uh, the insects coming because of the water and in the, uh, in the pond there we get newts and frogs and fish and all of these things and slow worms here as well which love to sun themselves in, in the garden. I'm afraid we could go on with this quite a long time but I must pause. Today I'm going to our little almshouse I've spoken of before, sheltered dwelling for uh, citizens who need that kind of care, a very historic almshouse called Jesus Hospital and over the last 21 years I've looked after them uh, in terms of going to um, not only chair their trustees but also celebrate communion with them in their chapel and then afterwards we'd sit down and have a cup of coffee and a piece of cake or something together and, and talk about things which were very different from high finance or, uh, or, or highfalutin theology. It was just the ordinary facts of, of their own life and, and very enjoyable too. But I'm going this morning for a last time uh, and we'll celebrate communion with them and then they're wanting to have a little bit of a party and this week is a bit like that to say goodbye and thank you and I shall be saying thank you to them as well because going there has given me many many insights so I must stop this now and go on to celebrate communion at Jesus Hospital but for the moment it's time to say our prayers and <clears throat> this morning we are praying for let's find the piece here we are here's the sheet uh, on the 9th of May <coughs> we're praying for the Diocese of Lexington in the Episcopal Church of the United States of America and in this diocese for Justin our Archbishop for Rose Bishop of Dover for Emma Bishop at Lambeth and for clergy with permission to officiate which means they are priests who can help out often in retired um, state but they can help out in the parishes <coughs> within the wheeled deanery and <coughs> as the week goes on we shall be praying for the parishes of the wheeled places like Benenden and Cranbrook and Goudhurst and Hawkehurst and Headcorn so that will happen day by day but for the moment we give thanks for the ministry of all those clergy who help with permission to officiate in the churches of the wield. So let's say our prayer. <coughs> now we're on, <coughs> sorry, we're on a different colic today. The colic for the fourth Sunday of Easter. And bring your own intentions and your prayers from across the world. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, raise us who trust in him from the death of sin to the life of righteousness that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we say, each in our own language, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of reflection and silence as we are still, as we hold ourselves in the presence of God, as the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God.
we've been talking about the making of the, the runnel and the ponds. Uh, and on uh, Saturday, we had two friends of ours who, uh, Martin Lawford has been part of our workforce here with very skilled hands for all the time I've been here. And uh, he was the one who helped Fletcher with all of this. They had a creative partnership doing this. It was after a particularly tragic and sad time in uh, the life of Martin and his wife Julie. Uh, and this was a, a place of quiet where that creative activity together for both of them was uh, a, a happy time as well as a, a healing time. But Martin and Julie came to see us to say goodbye <coughs> on Saturday and uh, we walked up to here uh, to show Martin just how the um, runnel and the ponds that he created at that time, some eight or nine years ago, I think they did that together with Fletcher, uh, the two of them, and uh, that had developed into all the things we've been speaking about, bringing water into the garden. So sometimes creative work can be something that in a sad time, a tragic time or a puzzling time, can help towards a healing time as well and that uh, gardens ha can have that effect as well. So we give thanks for all of that this morning. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you would pray for, now and always. Amen. Well, time for a riddle answer before I go off to Jesus Hospital and maybe a couple more. So the answers to yesterday, um, where are we? I can be long or short, I can be grown or bought, I can be painted or left bare. What am I? Uh, a fingernail is the answer to that one. And then I am white and perfect for cutting and grinding. I am a useful tool for most mammals. What am I? Well, that's a tooth. Today, here are two more. I never was, but always will be. No one ever saw me, but everyone knows I exist. What am I? And I row quickly with four oars, yet never come out from under my roof. What am I? And a fable. Let's do that too. I've got the book down here. There we are. Yesterday we were the town mouse and the country mouse. And today the bear and the bees. We've no bears in this garden. We do have bees. <coughs> A bear was once searching for berries in the woods when he came across an old log where bees had stored their honey. Wishing to find out whether the bees were at home, he sniffed around the log with some caution. Along came a bee on his way home from the fields with more honey, and on seeing the bear, he angrily leapt upon his nose, stung him once and flew swiftly into his house. The wretched bear then rushed at the log with his teeth and claws, but the entire nest of bees poured out and swathed all over his body. Stumbling away in agony, the bear was only able to save himself by falling headfirst into a nearby pond. And uh, the moral? It is better to bear a single injury in silence than to bring about a thousand by reacting in anger. So there's a moral which could easily be in the wisdom writing of the old scriptures. Enjoy your day wherever you are and I shall go and enjoy my time with the residents of Jesus Hospital.